Good evening, class. A little music to welcome you. We're going to listen for a little bit, see if you might have any guesses what this is. Any guesses what that might be? We've heard this uh, from our St. Philip's Choir a few times. It is, I think, really, really beautiful with a powerful text. And what that text is relates directly to our letter this evening because the text which comes from 1 Peter is love one another with a pure heart fervently. And we'll be talking a little bit uh, later on in tonight's class about why that is so important and why it annoys the heck out of the devil. So as we get ready to begin this evening, let us open with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of this time to be able to look into your word and to be able to look into the work of your servant, C.S. Lewis, expressed in these screw tape letters. Lord, we pray that as we examine these letters and look at the truth of your holy word expressed in the scriptures that we will talk about, that you would take our hard hearts and that you would make them malleable and that you would change us so that we might more and more live out the truth of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen. So as we do every week, uh, let's begin by going back to our cornerstone verse from Ephesians about spiritual warfare. And I would encourage you to go ahead and say this aloud with me. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. This verse is so rich, and it tells us so much about our enemy uh, and reminds us of the truth that Lewis unpacks in these letters, that Satan is real, that he is out to get us, that there are cosmic forces uh, in this present darkness that are sending darts of the evil one at us all the time. But the great good news is that we have not only the whole armor of God 
and the Word of God, uh, the sword of the Spirit. But we also know that Jesus has won the battle, that he has won the victory, and that when we resist the devil, leaning on Jesus, then we stand on solid ground. So this week, as we move to uh, letter 26, I want us to just, again, rehearse some of the reasons we're studying this book and to look at some of the habits from recent weeks. And some of you may wonder, why does he repeat these habits over and over again? And I will tell you, there is some method to the madness here, which is that we live in a culture of uh, novelties, as Lewis talked about in letter 25, where we want what's new and we want to throw out what's old. But one of the secrets of habits is repetition, repetition and more repetition. So I'm trying to practice what I preach here or practice what Lewis preaches. Uh, and really what the scriptures tell us by reminding us of these habits multiple times uh, and hoping that that enables us to let them sink in perhaps a little bit more than they might otherwise. But generally, the reasons we want to be studying this book is to remind us that we're in a battle because our culture is a tidal wave telling us that we're not in a battle, that there's no such thing as evil, and there certainly is not a devil. Secondly, is learning to think Christianly and to develop a Christian worldview. Thinking is something that uh, often seems in short supply, that we are ready to just accept what others tell us. We're not so good at researching, thinking, weighing various points of view and all of those things. But this book is rich in teaching us how to think and think Christianly. It is also rich in helping us understand the psychology of temptation, how Satan tries to come after us. Because if we know what his tactics are, then we are better equipped to withstand them with the armor of God. We want to learn and develop habits that will enable us to deepen our faith in Christ and thus to live a boldly Christian life, a life that annoys the devil because we are living out the truth of God's word, the sword of the spirit, and we are proclaiming the truth of his kingdom. So as we've talked about this, we've talked about the importance of habits and particularly in these days of the pandemic, thinking about what habits compose our lives um, is a particularly worthwhile exercise. So I would commend to you this idea of habits and trying to develop ones that will draw us more and more toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So going back a couple of letters uh, and rehearsing some of those habits from letter 22, which we'll remember is the one where screw tape goes ballistic because the patient has started a romantic relationship with a thoroughly Christian girl from a thoroughly Christian family. So habits to annoy the devil from that letter. The first one is to seek deep Christian commitment as the most important quality in dating relationships. This, of course, flies in the face of our culture, uh, which is so often based on outward appearance or maybe uh, common interest or what we can get out of the person um, all sorts of things other than a deeply shared Christian commitment. The second habit from that letter is to live joyfully into the bounty of pleasures that God has created. That letter reminds us, as Screwtape says, that at God's right hand there are pleasures forevermore, that God is the author of pleasure, and that when we live into those pleasures and see him as their source, there is a goodness with a capital G that comes from that and a reminder that God is the giver of every good gift. Thirdly, cultivate a home and family deeply infused with the love of Christ, beauty, and agape love for others. 
You'll remember in that letter 22 how Screwtape is just disgusted by the whole atmosphere of this family and household and really upset that the influence of this household is so strong that when you walk into the house, its beauty and the kindness and uh, self-sacrificial love that exists in that place uh, draws other people and affects them. And Screwtape just can't stand that and is really bothered because the Christian uh, theme within that home is so prevalent that the impenetrable cloud, that thing that Screwtape hates so much, the presence of the Holy Spirit is all over it. Fourthly, glory and the beauty and wonder of music. Screwtape in this letter famously says, music and silence, how I detest them both. We will make the whole world into one big noise. So that's a reminder to us that beautiful music annoys the devil. It's one of the reasons that we start each one of these classes with beautiful music. And I hope you will take the time uh, to listen to those links that go out in the email each week all the way through, because I am confident they will be a blessing to you. And that's a reminder, just as an aside, if you're watching the video uh, or listening to the podcast and you are not on our email list, please uh, send me an email at St. Philip's Church uh, in Charleston, which you can find easily on Google, uh, and ask me to add you to the list. The emails are a great way of keeping up and being able to dig a little bit deeper. And the second part uh, of annoying the devil with music is to also annoy the devil with silence to embrace silence, to consciously seek out times to be silent, to listen for the still small voice of God, to listen to what he might be desiring to speak into your heart, to quiet your soul, to listen to the beauty of the sounds of nature, all of those things that uh, when we are about all of the things that we usually preoccupy ourselves with, silence goes right out the window. And the concomitant of that is the next habit, reject constantly being surrounded by noise and sound. We've talked how remarkable it is that Lewis was writing this in the 1940s. And now we live in a world where it really is literally possible to be surrounded by sound and noise 24 seven, to sleep with earbuds in, um, some people's jobs allow them to keep uh, their earbuds in or music playing uh, the whole time they're at work. And then when they're at home, they're on media. Uh, that is a recipe to drown out the sounds of the kingdom of heaven. And then lastly, from that beautiful letter 22, remember that transformation is the work of the Holy Spirit not of our own efforts are those, or those of the life force. All too often, we think of our Christian faith as perhaps some kind of uh, spiritual self-help manual and that we can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. But the truth of that is expressed in the old hymn, No merit of my own I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. We can do nothing good of ourselves without the agency and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And the best thing we can do for transformation is to cast ourselves into the arms of the Lord and pray that he would take us and make us more like himself. Then from letter 23, there was that great opening paragraph that you might remember about how upset screw tape is that not only is the patient dating this Christian girl and with her family, but there's a whole circle of deeply committed, intelligent Christians that he's getting to know and that he finds very interesting. And what is even worse is that when they're together, they actually talk about their Christian faith and what that means about how they view what's going on in the world and how they see art and literature and all those things. And it is a reminder to us to know and take the initiative to get to know better 
deeply committed and intelligent Christians and to not only be with them, but to engage in talking about our faith and what it means to follow Jesus uh, in our lives. All too often we can be uh, thinking that somehow just by being in the same room, the osmosis principle works and we'll soak up something. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we need to be intentional about what we choose to talk about and how we speak spend time together nurturing and encouraging one another. The second thing is to be watchful about mixing theology and politics. All too often we get caught up in politics and our politics become louder than our faith and our political stands turn off people to the gospel, which is something that makes Satan romp about with glee. And we live in a time where this is particularly problematic. So we need to all take a step back, look at our political convictions, which important as they are, are not nearly as important as our faith in Jesus Christ, and make sure that we have things in the proper priority. Thirdly, to beware of new constructions of the historical Jesus. As this letter says, about every 30 years, there's a new historical Jesus, whether it is Jesus the revolutionary or Jesus the hippie or Jesus the moral teacher or Jesus who really didn't ever say he was the son of God. All of these crazy things that come out, um, we are to not get swept up uh, in the latest uh, fads about who Jesus is. And instead of that, the next habit, we are to focus on our relationship with Jesus, on worshiping him, on seeking his real presence, and not just focusing on his teaching. Obviously, Jesus' teaching is incredibly important, but he didn't come just to be a good teacher. He came to be the savior of the world. Which leads us to the fifth habit, hold fast to the centrality of Jesus' resurrection from the dead and God's plan of redemption. Jesus did not come to help us self-actualize. Jesus came because we were dead in our sins and to, through his resurrection from the dead and conquering of sin and death, to open the gates of life and immortality in the kingdom of heaven to us. Sixth, live proactively into each day in the understanding of Christ's kingdom as the truth with a capital T and the overarching reality of life, rather than being seduced into seeing Christianity as a means to an end. We all feel passionate about different causes, but we must be very careful because what Satan would love for us to do is to become so passionate about a cause that that truly becomes our idol and our God and our faith is just a way to help us do better in our cause. Then letter 24. Again, this is that letter about spiritual pride, uh, the vice that Jesus called out uh, in his earthly ministry against the Pharisees the ones who might have been expected to be his allies, the religious leaders, but the ones who ended up handing him over to be crucified. Remember that in this letter, Screwtape says that the most wonderful thing that can happen from Satan's point of view is for the patient to develop spiritual pride because it will cut him off not only from his relationship with God, but from having any influence for Christ's kingdom. So the first habit of that letter is to be wary of making assumptions about those who do not share your beliefs. This is basically the good old fashioned idea of prejudice. And we like to think sometimes as Christians that we are so above that, we would never be prejudiced. But in fact, we often are, and we can make assumptions about people we disagree with, people who don't share our faith, people who don't share our opinions about something, and we can judge them and write them off rather than investing in relationship with them. 
which of course is what Jesus did, pursuing relationship with all of those on the margins, and even with the Pharisees, his enemies, who despite their contentiousness, were so attracted to Jesus that they often invited him to dinner. Second, beware of spiritual pride as one of the devil's strongest vices, as we already have said. Third, cultivate humility and an awareness of your own unworthiness, but for Christ. I was talking with a friend about this uh, a few days ago, and one of the things that we both commented on was how having a deep sense of your own sinfulness about how much Christ has forgiven you and about how much you need Christ in your life as you seek daily to follow after him. All of those things remind you that you cannot afford to be arrogant spiritually because you are every day in need of God's amazing grace found in Jesus Christ. And the more that we cultivate that and cultivate our sense of wonder that God sent Jesus to die for us while we were yet sinners, it reminds us that we are all beggars showing other beggars where to find bread at the foot of the cross. Fourthly, flee. It's a great word. Flee. Run for your life from any sort of superior inner ring. That idea of being in the know, of being the inner circle, of being better than others because you know things they don't. You know secrets they don't. You know things that are going to happen before they do. And you can say, oh, I can't talk about that to you. It is all too easy to fall victim to this. And Satan loves this idea because it is a way of propping up our spiritual pride, uh, but giving us a, an excuse for it, if you will. So this whole idea of avoiding the inner ring is very important. And I commend to you, uh, if you haven't had a chance to read it, the essay that uh, was developed from Lewis's talk uh, at King's College London in the 1940s on the inner ring that went out in last week's email. And then fifthly, flee the temptation to believe that those who agree with you in every particular are the only real Christians. This is something that particularly in our culture today is so very important. When we live in times where the Christian faith is under attack in many countries, uh, it is so important that the Christians not be fighting one another, but be allied together with one another. And certainly we must hold fast to the essential core truths of the gospel. But within that, we need to not pick on uh, our Christian neighbors who differ from us, or we need to avoid becoming smug and thinking that we are so much better than any other Christians. And then lastly, letter 25, which we unpacked last week, center your bond of fellowship deeply in your common faith in Jesus Christ. The bond of fellowship is a particular bond that exists only between and among Christians. It's not just friendship. It is a relationship in which Jesus himself is part. Uh, as we say virtually every Sunday in church, when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou art there in the midst of them. Uh, which is the prayer of St. Chrysostom, but comes straight from uh, the words of the gospel. And it is a reminder to us that when we are together with brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus is there with us. And that special fellowship, that special bond that we have is so very important. And yet, even though that is true, all too often we try to base our relationships with one another in the body on other things. And what we need to do is all be looking at Jesus, because the more we look to Jesus together, the closer we will be to one another. Secondly, 
Beware of letting your faith get co-opted by any cause which you embrace. This is similar to what was said in the previous letter about not mixing faith and politics, but here Screwtape takes a broader view and says anything that you can get somebody excited about as a cause that they feel righteous indignation about, um, it's really easy to get that cause to become more important than the faith itself. And he has so many great examples in there, uh, Christianity and vegetarianism, Christianity and spelling reform, but it really could be Christianity and anything else. Uh, the important thing is to keep the gospel primary. Thirdly, embrace the rhythm and predictability of each season and its blessings. Not only the four seasons of the year, but the seasons of life. Uh, we are very susceptible to what Satan likes to do, which is to make us always want to be in a different season from the one in which we find ourselves. Not just the seasons of the year, although for some of us, we hate summer and wish that we had the cooler breeze of autumn or winter, or others who hate the cold of winter and can't wait for it to be summer again. And the problem is we spend our time being agitated because we're not the season where we want to be, and we miss the blessing of the season that God has given us. And that is all too true in the different seasons of life as well. Fourthly, avoid the horror of the same old thing and reject the incessant quest for novelty. This is one of Lewis's favorite themes, and it's beautifully expressed in this letter. And the whole idea is that we are all too ready to buy into what the pundits of our culture tell us is the newest, the latest, the most exciting, and therefore the most worthy and the most true. And the problem is when we seek after constant innovation and novelty, we are all too inclined to think, well, that same old thing, that can't be true. That's musty and out of date. And as Lewis says in the letter, that great word unchanged and unchanging that used to stand for something like a rock that was so beautiful and strong that that word has been replaced by stagnant which has the idea of leading to death. So related to that, the fifth and sixth habits, the fifth, be wary of adopting fashions or fads, especially spiritual ones that may blind you to the true dangers of your time. This is where we are like the Pharisees whom Jesus said strained out a gnat, but swallowed a camel. Focusing all too much on certain issues in the Christian world while seeing having huge areas of spiritual blindness and disobedience that we don't even engage. And then lastly, resist discarding the wisdom of the past in favor of ideas whose only virtue is that they are new or progressive. Progress, uh, in Lewis's view, was very often an illusion. It was something that was foisted upon us by various elites who told us we should believe or think a certain way because it was better because it was new. And he says, as Christians, we need to remember to sift everything through the word of God. And that brings us to letter 26, uh, another letter full of wisdom uh, and full of uh, habits that we can learn to annoy the devil. So get out your books, grab your highlighter, be ready to underline or make some margin notes. And here we go with letter 26. My dear Wormwood, yes, courtship is the time for sowing those seeds, which will grow up 10 years later into domestic hatred. The enchantment of unsatisfied desire produces results which the humans can be made to mistake for the results of charity. Avail yourself of the ambiguity in the word love. Let them think they have solved by love problems they have in fact only waived or postponed under the influence of the enchantment. While at last you have your chance to foment the problems in secret and render them chronic. 
The grand problem is that of unselfishness. Note once again the admirable work of our philological arm in substituting the negative unselfishness for the enemy's positive charity. Thanks to this, you can from the very outset teach a man to surrender benefits, not that others may be happy in having them, but that he, he may be unselfish in foregoing them. That is a great point gained. Another great help where the parties concerned are male and female is the divergence of view about unselfishness which we have built up between the sexes. A woman means by unselfishness chiefly taking trouble for others. A man means not giving trouble to others. As a result, a woman who is quite far gone in the enemy's service will make a nuisance of herself to us on a larger scale than any man except those whom our father has dominated completely. And conversely, a man will live long in the enemy's camp before he undertakes as much spontaneous work to please others as a quite ordinary woman may do every day. Thus, while the woman thinks of doing good offices and the man of respecting other people's rights, each sex, without any obvious unreason, can and does regard the other as radically selfish. On top of these confusions, you can now sow a few more. The erotic enchantment produces a mutual complacence in which each is really pleased to give in to the wishes of the other. They also know that the enemy demands of them a degree of charity which, if attained, would result in similar actions. You must make them establish as a law for their whole married life that degree of mutual self-sacrifice which is at present spouting naturally out of the enchantment but which, when the enchantment dies away, they will not have charity enough to enable them to perform. They will not see the trap, since they are under the double blindness of mistaking sexual excitement for charity and of thinking the excitement will last. When once a sort of official, legal, or nominal unselfishness has been established as a rule a rule for the keeping of which their emotional resources have died away and their spiritual resources have not yet grown, the most delightful results follow. In discussing any joint action, it becomes obligatory that party A should argue in favor of party B's supposed wishes and against his own, while B does the opposite. It is often impossible to find out either party's real wishes. With luck, they end by doing something that neither wants. While each feels a glow of self-righteousness and harbors a secret claim to preferential treatment for the unselfishness shown and a secret grudge against the other for the ease with which the sacrifice has been accepted. Later on, you can, inventure, you can venture on what may be called the generous conflict illusion. This game is best played with more than two players in a family with grown-up children, for example. Something quite trivial, like having tea in the garden, is proposed. One member takes care to make it quite clear, though not in so many words, that he would rather not, but is of course prepared to do so out of unselfishness. The others instantly withdraw their proposal, ostensibly through their own unselfishness, but really because they don't want to be used as a sort of lay figure on which the first speaker practices petty altruisms. But he is not going to be done out of his debauch of unselfishness. He insists on doing what the others want they insist on doing what he wants,
passions aroused. Soon, someone is saying, very well then, I won't have any tea at all. And a real quarrel ensues with bitter resentment on both sides. You see how it is done? If each side had been frankly contending for its own real wish, they would all have kept within the bounds of reason and courtesy. But just because the contention is reversed and each side is fighting the other side's battle, all the bitterness which really flows from thwarted self-righteousness and obstinacy and the accumulated grudges of the past 10 years is concealed from them by the nominal or official unselfishness of what they are doing or at least held to be excused by it. Each side is indeed quite alive to the cheap quality of the adversary's unselfishness and of the false position into which he is trying to force them, but each manages to feel blameless and ill-used itself with no more dishonesty than comes natural to a human. A sensible human once said, if people knew how much ill-feeling unselfishness occasions, it would not so often be recommended from the pulpit. And again, she's the sort of woman who lives for others. You can always tell the others by their hunted expression. All this can be done even in the period of courtship. A little real selfishness on your patient's part is often of less value in the long run for securing his soul than the first beginnings of that elaborate and self-conscious unselfishness which may one day blossom into the sort of thing I have described. Some degree of mutual falseness, some surprise that the girl does not always notice just how unselfish he is being, can be smuggled in already. Cherish these things, and above all, don't let the young fools notice them. If they notice them, they will be on the road to discovering that love is not enough that charity is needed and not yet achieved, and that no external law can supply its place. I wish Slum Trumpet could do something about undermining that young woman's sense of the ridiculous. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape. Well, once again, this letter is chock full of ways that Satan wants to get to us and ways that may seem a touch too familiar uh, and hit a little bit close to home. So the habits to annoy the devil from this letter. First, be proactive in positive virtue and do not define your faith in terms of what you don't do. This, of course, is the problem of the Pharisees saying that they are righteous because they don't do certain things. Uh, it is also the problem that uh, we've all heard about in the Bible Belt, of uh, that old saying, I'm a Christian, I don't smoke, drink, or chew, or go with those who do. Defining our Christian faith in terms of what we don't do, and nothing could be further from the gospel truth. And remember how uh, screw tape talks about the triumph of that word unselfishness instead of agape proactive love instead of that beautiful old-fashioned word charity which takes in love and being proactive and agape all at once listen to the scriptures first from Romans 12 let love be genuine abhor what is evil hold fast to what is good love one another with brotherly affection be proactive in positive virtue and do not define your faith in terms of what you don't do. This, of course, is one of the biggest problems with the Pharisees, who were all about the things they didn't do, the people that they didn't associate with, the types of foods that they didn't eat. And Jesus, of course, calls them out for having missed the whole point of their faith. It is also all too familiar to those of us in the Bible Belt who often have heard the old adage, I'm a Christian, I don't smoke, drink, or chew, or go with those who do. This is a defining of what it means to be Christian 
in a completely wrong way. It has nothing to do with these things. And it's all about where our hearts lie and our commitment to Jesus Christ. And as we saw in that beautiful song that we started off with, love one another from a pure heart fervently. I love that word fervently. And listen to these words from the scriptures, first from Romans 12. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to that which is good. Love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and practice hospitality. This is a great example of how proactive our charity should be. That rich word charity, which embraces love and love in the agape sense and a zealousness and richness, much more than just unselfishness. That changing of meaning of words is one of Screwtape and the devil's chief weapons and one that Lewis railed against that we are certainly called to be unselfish as Christians, but we're called to much more than that. We are called to love as Jesus did. And then from Jesus's own words, uh, right at the end of the temple dialogues, where he has asked this question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And we've heard that so many times because it's in our prayer book liturgy, but just think about that. All the law, all the law and the prophets depend on loving God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving our neighbor. Unselfishness is a pale shadow of what Christian love is meant to be. The second habit, be wary of defining selfishness on your own terms, judging the selfishness of others but turning a blind eye to your own. Ouch. This is another one of those that hits close to home. We all like to think of what selfishness is, but we often tend to define it in terms of what annoys us in others, and we fail to look at what might be selfishness in ourselves. This, of course, is all caught up in our temptation to judge other people which Jesus knew all too well, and it's why the seventh chapter of Matthew, uh, which is the last chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' greatest teaching, starts with that admonition, judge not that ye be not judged. An admonition we are all too quick to ignore and where we want to add, but Lord, if you really knew how they acted, you would judge them too. But listen to this. Listen to all Jesus says here. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck from your brothers. It is only when we have eliminated the log that messes up our vision and ability to judge rightly that we have the freedom to take the speck from our brother's eye. It's like that old quotation, old story about uh, Dwight L. Moody, the famous preacher and evangelist at the end of the 19th century, where there were some reporters trying to get him to comment on the faults of some other folks. 
and basically Moody shut them down and said, I have enough problems with D.L. Moody to work on without worrying about anyone else's. Now, this is not to say that other people don't sin. It is not to say that sometimes we need to speak the truth and love to others. But what we don't need to do is to define selfishness on our own terms and think that we are full of virtue because we are not selfish, but all those other people certainly are. Thirdly, and related to this, practice clear and honest communication, speaking the truth in love. Practice clear and honest communication, speaking the truth in love. Sometimes I think that if we could master just this one habit, it would turn the church upside down in a really good way. Because the problem for so many of us is that we are either prone to speak the truth but without any love or to be completely loving without speaking any truth and either one of those extremes puts us right into screw tape right into the devil's hands and what we need to do is to learn to speak the truth in love and ephesians 4 is a great passage on that listen to these words rather speaking the truth in love we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow, so it builds itself up in love. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let us each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Look how all of this is connected. When we fail to speak the truth in love, when we become angry and self-righteous, we give the devil an opportunity. Just as we've seen in Screwtape here, Lewis is only writing out of this scriptural truth that we see in Ephesians, that when we fail to love, that when we judge and we fail to speak the truth in a love, we give the devil an opportunity. And it sets Christians at odds with each other. I would encourage you to think about that passage we just read from Matthew 7 about the person with the log in his eye and the brother with the speck and just imagine that visually and literally. If you had a log, a six foot log in your eye, and you had a friend that you objected to something they were doing, and you decided to try to take a speck out of that person's eye while you have a six foot log in your own, every time you approach that person, you're going to literally club him or her in the head with the log. And so basically what happens is that both people get battered and bloody as a result of that operation. It is so different from the beautiful vision Paul paints here of when we speak the truth in love, the whole body works together properly, each part doing its own part, and the body grows and builds itself up in love. The fourth habit, beware accumulating grudges. Ouch. There it is again, another one of those close to home truths. And most of us would say, oh, I don't hold grudges. I don't do that. But the fact of the matter is most of us do. And the interesting thing is that there are pages and pages and pages of scriptures about this. And the problem with holding a grudge is that it is just as screw tape understands when we do that it enables satan to sow discord and to bring every manner of relational dysfunction and anger and brokenness particularly in close relationships like families how many of you please don't raise your hand on the video um, have people in your family or know of people where there are people in the same family who have not spoken to one another for years, even people who are Christians. 
and it is all because of grudges that have been held. And certainly we do wound each other in terrible ways, but as Christians we are commanded to seek forgiveness, to seek reconciliation, and to not hold grudges. Just two little scriptures here. First from Leviticus 19.18, um, from which Jesus draws the second part of the great commandment. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And then in that great love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, uh, which you'll probably remember, uses that old powerful old English word charity, uh, which used to mean a lot more than it does now. Uh, used to be that charity was the word that was all throughout that chapter. But here we have love does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Now, in this age of uh, looking for microaggressions and looking to be offended and all of that, this is radical stuff, but it's part of why the gospel is radical. It's a radical kind of love, and we can't love that way if we hold grudges. And then lastly, practice serving in humble, loving charity without expectation of notice or reward. All too often we get our nose out of joint because we did something for someone else or we did something for the Lord or for the church even and no one said thank you. They didn't notice how we gave up our time and how inconvenient it was and that we did that to help those people and they didn't even have the courtesy to say thank you. So that's the last time I'm doing that. Thank you very much. Well, we have just made Screwtape dance with glee. We must learn the scriptural truth that when we are serving the Lord, we are to work as serving him not man. And that means we are not to be seeking to be noticed or proved or thanked or congratulated or any of those things. Listen to what Jesus says in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 6. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Jesus is very clear here. We are to serve from a pure heart, fervently seeking and serving the Lord, not looking for the recognition of man. And Jesus here points out a particularly heinous sin of the time, one that was actually approved by the Pharisees. And the sin was that when rich people were coming to give in the temple, what they would do is they would often get the money and have it brought in the lowest denomination, like uh, what would be pennies for us, so that it would have a greater volume of coins. They would hire a trumpeter to go before them as they made their way into the temple. And then they would get to the place where the offering was to be given, which was very often a metal sort of receptacle into which you would pour the coins and it would make a huge amount of noise and people would say oh what a righteous generous person who's giving all of that money but what jesus says here is if that's what your motivation is that is all the reward you are going to get you are not serving god you are trying to make yourself look good 
And Lewis harped on this in many places in his writing, but my favorite uh, is a little poem he wrote called Epitaph. And it goes like this, erected by her sorrowing brothers in memory of Martha Clay. Here lies one who lived for others. Now she has peace and so have they. And what Lewis has in mind is that officious type of person who goes around seeking to serve others and seeking to help, but with all the wrong motivations, and is always calling attention to themselves and interfering to try to make it look like they are about the Lord's business. And of course, it's all too easy to say, oh yes, I've known some people like that. But the problem is we need to look in the mirror and think about when we might have been that person. All this letter is about this idea of how important it is that we be proactively loving people whom God puts in our path, proactively loving and worshiping the Lord himself, and that our faith not be defined in terms of what we don't do. Now, certainly as Christians, there are things that we shouldn't participate in, but that's not what it means to be a Christian. What it means to be a Christian is to be someone in relationship with Jesus Christ, following him, adopting his priorities, living as he did, bringing the values of the kingdom so that they break out where we go as they broke out wherever he went. I commend to you uh, the talk that Canon J. John gave at St. Philip's during his recent visit on the Wednesday night. I'm going to include the link to that talk uh, in the email follow-up, but it's just a reminder about how important it is to be alert to the people that God puts in our path for us to love. As Christians, we are all too often wanting to plan out what the Lord's will is for us. You see a little irony there? Rather than being invested in the people that God puts in front of us each day. So I commend that link to you. I commend this letter to you. I commend to you to spend some time in prayer asking that God would plant in you this deep love, this deep charity, which is the only thing that can really change the world. The love of Jesus, which is the amazing grace of the gospel. Let's close with that quotation from letter eight that's such a good reminder of why habits, why being obedient to a habit, even when you don't feel like it, is so important in bringing the kingdom of God. Our cause is never more in danger, Wormwood, than when a human, no longer desiring, but still intending to do the enemy's will, looks round upon a universe from which every trace of him seems to have vanished, and asks why he has been forsaken and still obeys. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we confess to you how easy it is for us to judge others, how easy it is for us to glory in how unselfish we are and to become proud and not even realize, Lord, that we are in the sin of pride and of judging others. Lord, we pray that instead of that, you would draw us to your cross, that we would know our unworthiness, and that we would seek to love others as you have first loved us, that in so doing, your love might be shown by us in such a way that people are drawn to you and the things of your kingdom. Lord, we pray that your people might be a sweet aroma in this world that so desperately needs your love. We pray for your grace to abound in our lives. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with us tonight, and we look forward to being together again next week. God bless you.